Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, Iran has ratcheted up its war of words against Israel. Tehran's mission to the United Nations vowed that if Israel goes to war against Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Jewish state will be obliterated and warned that all options are on the table. Foreign Minister Israel Katz was quick to respond by saying if Hezbollah does not cease its fire and withdraw from southern Lebanon, Israel will act against the terror group with full force until security is restored and the residents of the north can return to their homes. Katz went on to say that a regime that threatens destruction deserves to be destroyed. Hezbollah has refused to obey U.N. Security Council Resolution 1701 that demands the terrorist group withdraw north beyond the Litani River. An unnamed U.S. official was quoted as saying, the risk of war between Israel and Hezbollah is higher than it has been in several weeks. Hezbollah terror boss Hassan Nasrallah boasted that no place in Israel would be spared in the case of a full-blown war. An expanding Israel-Hezbollah war could begin soon. The German newspaper, Bild, quotes diplomatic sources as saying Israel will launch its offensive into Lebanon during the second half of July unless the Iranian-backed terror group holds its fire. However, Hezbollah has vowed not to stop its attacks on Israel until the war in Gaza ends. Germany's Lufthansa Airlines has suspended night flights to Beirut until the end of July. The German government also urged its citizens to leave Lebanon, as did the countries of Canada, Kuwait, Macedonia, Saudi Arabia, and the Netherlands. The United States called on its citizens to reconsider travel plans to Lebanon. At first glance, it looks like a typical children's board game, but upon closer inspection, it is deadly serious. Soldiers with the Nahal Reconnaissance Battalion found the Snakes and Ladders game while operating in the area of Rafa in Gaza. It shows pictures of missiles and tanks on top of different locations throughout Israel. In addition, there are images of Hamas terrorists going through tunnels, indicating a direction of movement to the players. The game is a cynical method of teaching and encouraging terrorism in children. During the course of the war, the IDF has collected a large amount of evidence exposing how Hamas indoctrinates children from a young age to hate Israel and Jews. Arab terrorists in the Gaza Strip fired nearly two dozen rockets at Israeli border communities. This was the largest barrage of missiles in the past seven months. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror group claimed responsibility for the attack, which originated near the area of Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip. Further south in the city of Rafah, IDF troops of the Commando Brigade located and destroyed Islamic Jihad's largest rocket manufacturing site. The subterranean facility was used to build hundreds of projectiles. During the operation, Israeli soldiers battled gunmen above and below ground, killing several terrorists. The Anti-Defamation League and the Crowell and Mooring International Law Firm in Washington have filed a federal lawsuit alleging that Iran, Syria and North Korea provided material support to the Hamas terror organization that enabled it to commit atrocities in Israel on October 7th. The suit names over 100 plaintiffs, including U.S. citizens, who were injured or killed as a result of the barbaric attack and immediate family members of the victims. The ADL said it is doing everything possible to hold Hamas terrorists and those who support them accountable. Foreign countries that sponsor terrorist activities typically refuse to honor judgments against them. However, the Crowell and Mooring law firm has decades of experience in litigating and winning terrorism cases. The company believes it is imperative to combat terrorism using whatever tools are available, including the courts and the U.S. Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Fund. The former head of Israel's Civil Aviation Authority has accused Turkey of committing an unimaginable act by refusing to refuel an El Al passenger jet. Neri Arconi said it was a blatant violation of the bilateral aviation agreement between Ankara and Jerusalem. He urged Israel's transportation minister, finance minister, and prime minister to take action. The El Al flight from Tel Aviv to Warsaw made an emergency landing in Turkey after a passenger suffered a medical emergency that required immediate hospitalization. 
The local staff at the Turkish airport refused to refuel the Israeli plane. The El Al pilot was forced to fly to the nearby Greek island of Rhodes for refueling before continuing to Warsaw, Poland. Anti-Semitism continues to raise its ugly head in Canada. Two Toronto Jewish houses of worship were attacked on the same day, causing panic and fear in the community. The first incident occurred at the Pride of Israel synagogue where windows were shattered. In the second incident, a vandal threw a stone through the window of the Kilat Sharei synagogue that had been targeted before. The attacks were described by Toronto police as suspected hate-motivated crimes. There has been a dramatic upsurge in violence in Canada that includes many anti-Semitic shootings, firebombings, bomb threats, and vandalism of Jewish institutions and businesses since October 7th, when bloodthirsty Hamas savages attacked Israel. There is no future for Jews in France. That is the feeling of Moshe Sebag, the chief rabbi of the Paris Grand Synagogue. He told the Jerusalem Post that he advises young French Jews to immigrate to Israel or a more secure country. The rabbi expressed his concern for the Jewish community following the rise of the right-wing National Party in recent elections and the changing attitude of the left that has become more anti-Semitic in recent times. He said the Jews are caught in the middle because they don't know who hates them the most. Rabbi Sibag pointed out that Jewish immigrants to France after World War II went to great lengths to fully integrate into French society, but the increasing influx of Muslim migrants refused to do so. Archaeologist Stephen Compton has made waves in the world of biblical archaeology by identifying the site of a biblical battle that took place in Jerusalem 2,700 years ago. The researcher used maps carved in the wall of Sennacherib's palace, which depict the Assyrian conquest of Lashish, located south of Jerusalem. Compton compared the carvings of the base with aerial photos of Jerusalem taken in 1910 and discovered that the images match. He announced that the modern-day location of Ammunition Hill appears to be the site of Sennacherib's camp from the Siege of Jerusalem, which is featured in three books of the Bible. The prophet Isaiah and the book of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles all describe God's victory over the mounting Assyrian armies when an angel of the Lord passed through their camp and killed 185,000 enemy troops in one night. While there are similar accounts of this incident in other ancient cultures, this is the first evidence of the biblical battle until now. Summertime in Israel is supposed to be warm, but last month was blistering. The Israel Meteorological Service said it was the hottest June since record-keeping began in the Holy Land more than 100 years ago. The temperature was 3 degrees Celsius or 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the average. June is usually the coolest of the summer months in Israel, but not this year. There were several back-to-back -back heat waves with a new record temperature of 48.1 degrees Celsius or 118.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Jerusalem and the Iranian threat were the focus of this year's European Policy Summit hosted by the Israel Allies Foundation, Europe. Legislators from across the continent gathered at the Dutch Parliament in The Hague, where participants held discussions highlighting the alarming, unprecedented attacks by the radical Shiite government in Tehran and its destabilizing impact on regional security and global peace. Member of Parliament Chris Stauffer, a leader of the IAF in the Netherlands, said it was time to take a strong stance in condemning Iran's terrorist regime and to show clear support for Israel. There was also harsh criticism of the International Criminal Court for its deceitful, biased rulings against Israel. European legislators condemned the scourge of anti-Semitism sweeping through the world following Israel's war against genocidal Hamas terrorists. Delegates were urged to advocate for the relocation of European embassies to Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel. Josh Reinstein, the president of the Israel Allies Foundation, said, The playing field is becoming level as more and more pro-Israel candidates win elections across Europe. He added that through faith-based diplomacy, people are beginning to realize the importance of standing with Israel, the one free democracy in the Middle East.
That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Olga Deutz. She's the vice president of NGO Monitor. Olga, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Olga, tell our viewers a little about what is NGO Monitor? NGO Monitor is a Jerusalem-based research institute created 20 years ago by U.S. professor Gerald Steinberg, who is still our president. And we look at the activities of the so-called human rights and humanitarian uh, non-governmental organizations that are active within the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But instead of promoting human rights, they tend to promote anti-Semitism, anti-Israel agendas, and oftentimes have uh, connections to terror. So this issue has actually come up a lot, especially with UNRWA. We saw in the UN that they are actually funding and sometimes even taking part in the terrorism itself. Who's funding these organizations in large? UNRWA is only one out of 25 UN agencies that are active here in Gaza, but in general within the Palestinian society, it is the most uh, or the best known one, right? Um, and they all are funded through humanitarian aid. Now, humanitarian aid, when we say the international community and giving humanitarian aid, we envision hundreds of countries. But at the end of the day, we're talking about 30 developed countries, according to OSCD. Um, and according to conservative estimates, since the Oslo Accords, which is basically in the last 30 years, these 30 countries funneled around $40 billion in humanitarian aid to the Palestinians. And again, as you say, as we've seen, much of this was diverted to either physically support terror, to build t t tunnels and rockets, but also, and this is much less known to the public, a a component of humanitarian aid is political advocacy. So when the UN asks the donor countries to give uh, only in the last quarter uh, of 2023, following the October the 7th, $1.4 billion in humanitarian aid, you need to know that a huge portion of that goes to political advocacy, which is just a nice word for anti-Israel activities and anti-Semitic activities around the world. So the question is why? This is self-defeating. Why would the Western countries around the world, the developed countries, want to fund terror and pro-Islamic sentiment? Well, it's a million dollars question, right? Sometimes it is lack of knowing and lack of uh, understanding what is really happening on the ground. Most countries don't have proper and sufficient vetting mechanisms to check. Who do I work with? Who are my partners? How does the money go? And through whom does the money go? And do my partners on the ground know how to distribute aid, right? Um, but sometimes there is an ideological uh, component to that. Um, and there are governments that uh, do believe that Israel is an apartheid or believe that Israel after the October the 7th in their military operation, uh, in their defense military operation against Hamas, right, is uh, forging a genocide or a and so on. Most of these are planted uh, within the parliaments of the, the countries around the world by these so-called human rights um, NGOs. So you'll have a situation in which um, Amnesty International sues the Netherlands um, to prevent it from supplying Israel U.S. military aid F-35 uh, components that are just physically being stored in the Netherlands, right? Uh, but the, the information is being given by Palestinian NGOs who are enjoying humanitarian aid. And that's just one example. $40 billion is a ridiculous amount of money. How can these countries see that they're giving this amount of money to the Palestinians and all they get in response is terror tunnels, terrorists, things like that, and not understand that they're doing something wrong. That's a perfect way to put it, right? Because for that amount of money, plus add to that all the money from the Muslim countries that the Palestinian society has received, one would have assumed that they would have built a Singapore <laughs> in Gaza, right, by now. But instead, there has been a steady process of radicalization of the Palestinian society. The o October 7th massacre did not happen in a vacuum. The fact is that no one in the society, Palestinian society condemned it. Not only did they not condemn it, but most of these human rights NGOs uh, 
uh, refused to accept the fact that it ever happened, and they uh, they deny the sex crimes, uh, the rape crimes. They deny that the massacre ever happened. They even went so far to accuse that this whole thing was made up by Israel only to justify uh, going into Gaza and so on. Um, and they took it further on to, for example, the International Court Justice Court in The Hague when the South Africans uh, accused Israel of, uh, of genocide. It was actually the Palestinian NGOs uh, that co-authored this claim. So there was a steady process of radicalizing the society making hate a normal thing and sort of dismissing the responsibility because instead of holding the Palestinian Authority accountable to have you build a democracy, have you build a society, are you really upholding human rights in your society, everything becomes a question of yes, occupation, no occupation, and simply denying Israel's right to exist regardless of its borders. Whoever tries to tell you that it's about this or that border is not really telling the truth. Although there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? When you watch the news, be critical. Not everything that you hear in the news is accurate. And what we can tell you based on our open source based research, right, this is all original sources, is that most of it comes from politicized groups who have an ulterior motive. And the ulterior motive is actually to deny Israel's right to exist as a Jewish homeland democratic but homeland of the Jewish people, the only such country in the world. And I also want to appeal to you to when you see something like that, reach out to your elected officials, reach out to your local leaders and raise the voice. Let us hear also that those who hate Israel are not the majority, because sometimes they tend to be the, the loud ones. Thank you, Ogla, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. And now the truth from Zion. Today, the issue of refugee status in the Middle East is often dominated by discussions about Palestinians. But there is a side of this conflict that frequently gets overlooked the plight of Jewish refugees. The majority of Israelis are the descendant of Jewish refugees who escaped brutal tyrannies in the Arab world. Jewish men living in Arab nations were not allowed to own businesses or openly practice Judaism. They constantly worried that their homes would be confiscated by the state or robbed by local anti-Semites. Many were harassed, beaten, or killed by Arabs who would not tolerate Jews. After generations of abuse, when the state of Israel was declared, Arab nations gleefully threw out their Jews. Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Iran uprooted their Jewish communities. Muslims in these nations carried out violent, hateful, targeted pogroms against their Jewish neighbors, forcing them out of the countries that Jews had been living in for centuries. They had to leave everything behind. Iran instituted discriminatory laws that prohibited Jews from taking their personal possessions with them. They had to surrender their finances and were unable to sell their homes or any assets. Despite being forced from their homes throughout Africa and the Middle East, the Jewish people were never called refugees, and not one international organization rushed to their aid. When they were exiled, the world pretended as though it was not happening. Jews relied on hard work and put their hopes in the promised land. Their support came from the newly established state of Israel and the hundreds of thousands of Jews already living there. With nothing but the shirts on their backs, they embarked on a journey to a land they could call home for the first time in 2,000 years. One of Tel Aviv's oldest neighborhoods predates the city's establishment. It's called Kerem HaTemonim, which was established by Jewish families from Yemen who are known to have journeyed across Africa without shoes or money with the hope of reaching the promised land. They turned a piece of desert into a thriving commercial market which today is a trendy place for young Israelis to live. Another group of Jewish refugees were millions of European Jews escaping the ashes of the Holocaust. Some were relocated outside of Europe through friends and families with visas in other countries, but many put themselves on boats and kissed the ground when they arrived on the shores of Israel. They quickly relinquished their refugee identity and worked tirelessly to become integral members of Israeli society, 
contributing to its vibrant tapestry in various fields. Former member of Knesset Rand Cohen escaped persecution in Baghdad, Iraq, when he was just 13 years old. Police raided his home in the dead of night, arresting his family for the crime of being Jewish. His parents sent him ahead, smuggling him through Iran. He arrived to the Holy Land alone, just shortly after Israel became a nation. He reunited with his brother who had been sent earlier. Eventually, his parents also made it to Israel. After putting himself through school and army service, Cohen became active in Israeli politics and eventually served as the Minister of Industry and Trade. He speaks openly about his harrowing tale of escaping persecution and his determination to excel in the merit of his parents. There are countless others whose stories may not make headlines, but are equally inspiring. These Jewish refugees have overcome adversity to build new lives for themselves and their families in Israel, and they did it all without global sympathy, recognition, or support. The plight of Jewish refugees is often overshadowed by the ongoing narrative surrounding Palestinian refugees. Palestinians are the only group of refugees to have a UN organization dedicated solely to them. That organization, UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, has been failing at lifting Palestinians out of refugee status for 75 years. The idea is to continue spreading their anti-Semitic narrative that the Jewish nation is intentionally oppressing them. In reality, the United Nations and their discriminatory rules have forced Palestinians into a perpetual state of living as refugees for multiple generations who can only survive with welfare. It's time to shine a spotlight on the forgotten refugees, the Jewish refugees whose stories deserve to be heard, honored, and appreciated. Without help, Jewish refugees managed to rise up and overcome their circumstances by hard work and determination. Their resilience and success serve as a testament to the human spirit, the living values of the Torah, and their daily hope for a brighter future. Up next, the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. ICEJ is passionate about offering practical help and life-changing opportunities to those in need in every sector of Israeli society. Since Israel's war with Hamas began, Israeli citizens have been negatively impacted economically with many business owners losing more than 50% of their monthly income. This makes it difficult to keep their business afloat and to provide for their families. Government compensation offers insufficient relief for small businesses, many that are operated by women. The situation is even more complicated for those evacuated from their homes, far away from their customer base. To help alleviate these challenges, the ICEJ is sponsoring business mentorship and giving grants to help small businesses succeed, even in these challenging times. Since 1980, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem has been a voice of Christian support for Israel and connected the global church to the land of the Bible. Headquartered in Jerusalem, the ICEJ has taken action to stand with Israel by caring for Holocaust survivors, helping Jewish families return home to Israel, providing bomb shelters, fighting anti-Semitism around the world, and by inviting Christians to discover Israel for themselves. My name is Alicia Nudelman Simet. I'm a tour, tour guide, and it was my dream since I came to Israel in 1982. I love to tour the city, to tour the country, the history, the archaeology, the places. And one year before the COVID pandemic, I started my course. And I received my license, I started to work and it was fantastic. But then pandemic came from, from one day to the other, no business. No business at all. Okay, after COVID, life went on and uh, everything was okay. The business, 
and 7th, October 7th. We are six months into this war. Since then, you know, no pilgrims, no tourists, no activity. I, I decided to take the mentorship because I said, okay, three meetings, what can I have to lose? It's okay. But I didn't really believe a lot. And it was amazing. In three important things for me. First of all, that it helped me to be focused that this is what I wanted. Because the two first weeks after the war, I really thought that, okay, tourism is not, it's not stable in this country. I'm not sure I can do it. Perhaps, I don't know, I have. And with the help of the mentor, it was for me clear, this is what I want to do. My business is connected, I think, for my hope of peace. I would love to go back and have people traveling with me all over the country. The idea of Christian groups supporting this kind of mentoring project, for me it was so emotive, so amazing. After Hamas brutally attacked Israel on October the 7th, 2023, the ICEJ has been actively standing with Israel and her people through advocacy and urgently needed aid projects. Now is the time for Christians to turn their love for Israel and the Jewish people into real action as never before. Your donation will help deliver bomb shelters to at-risk areas, provide necessary supplies for first responders, support affected citizens with trauma care, and will eventually help rebuild these devastated communities. Visit ICEJUSA.TV to donate online or call 1-800-910-6355 and give your generous gift today. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rom reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.